This will be an overview of the book of Acts, also called the Acts of the Apostles, and the Acts of the Apostles just means like the works or labor of the apostles. This book has 28 chapters, 1,007 verses, and around 24,250 words. The author is Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke. Historically, what you have in the book of Acts historically is Luke is writing to a man named Theophilus about Israel's final rejection of the kingdom of heaven. Doctrinally, the book of Acts doctrinally has the sign gifts of the which the apostles have which will come back in the tribulation time period. You see, the sign gifts were to those unbelieving Jews. You see, because they were trying to get these unbelieving Jews to believe the word that was being preached, and they were using signs to confirm the words that they were preaching. That's why you see some crazy stuff happen. And you see, those sign gifts have to come back in the tribulation because that's when that's when the Lord goes back to dealing with the Jews again. You see, in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, it says the Jews require a sign. And one of those signs is tongues. In 1 Corinthians 14.22, it says tongues are for a sign. So devotionally, the book of Acts devotionally, you should rejoice if you are counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. In the book of Acts, the apostles were beaten, stoned, shamed, shipwrecked, and martyred in the book of Acts. I mean, they're getting just clobbered by people, rejecting the message. And devotionally, we should rejoice if we're counted worthy to suffer shame for his name, just like they did. So with that quick introduction, let's just dive into the book of Acts and just look at verses here and there. See what we can learn from it and things like that. In chapters 1 through 7, you have the kingdom of heaven offered to Israel again, but they reject it. In chapter 1, you have the ascension of Jesus Christ and the disciples watching as he goes up. And it says in Acts 1, 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ, he died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and he resurrected, and people actually saw him. I mean, there was many witnesses. Many people saw him for those days. And we accept it by faith, but there were witnesses back then who saw Jesus Christ with their own two eyes, and he showed them he showed himself alive after many infallible proofs. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 6, or verse 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me as one born out of due time. So he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once. And in Acts 1, 5 it quotes Jesus and says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So there is more than one baptism in the Bible, you see. Uh, being baptized with the Holy Ghost has nothing to do with water. It said, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And that's making a distinction between those two baptisms. And that second baptism, the spirit baptism, that's explained in 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen, which says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Notice that. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Not by your pastor. Not by a church of Christ elder. Not in water. So the church of Christ wants to make this a water baptism. But it's a spirit baptism. For by one spirit 
Are we all baptized in the one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit? The moment you got saved, you were baptized into the body of Christ. And the disciples asked Jesus an important question in this same chapter, in Acts chapter 1. And this is a key to the book of Acts, this question that they ask. It says in Acts 1, 6 through 8, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Jews asked Jesus, the disciples, they said, at this time, they asked him if he would at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. You see, Israel lost the kingdom back in 606 B.C. They haven't had it back since. But when Jesus manifested in the flesh, he came down to offer the physical kingdom of heaven back to Israel if they would receive him. And this time he was also offering them the spiritual kingdom of God at the same time. But the Jews rejected the, father, the prophets in the Old Testament. They rejected the, the Father when they did that. They reject the Son, the Son of God in the Gospels. And they reject the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts when they reject the disciples. In the Gospels, they rejected John the Baptist and they rejected Jesus Christ. So they reject the Son in the Gospels. And then all through the book of Acts, you see them rejecting the disciples. That's them rejecting the Holy Spirit. They reject three times, three, you know, the first three strikes and you're out. That's what they did. If the Jewish people would have, have accepted him, then there wouldn't have been a church age that we're in today. He would have had he would have restored the kingdom to Israel. And that is why Jesus didn't answer the question. Because they still had a chance at this point. They said, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well he might would have if they would have No, not you know, not rejected him. But the higher ups rejected him. In Acts 1, 9 through 11, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So they are talking to Jesus Christ, and bam, he's gone. And a cloud receives him out of their sight, and I think the clouds have some teleportation device or something connected to it with a door maybe that will just teleport you into the third heaven. But I'm guessing someone on the other side of the door has to open it and let you in. In Acts 1, 16 through 18, it says, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was God to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. So Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. And after he got caught, he hung himself. He fell down and busted his head wide open. And this pictures the head wound of the Antichrist. And it says in Acts 1.25 that he may, may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell that he might go to his own place. So Judas went to his own place when he died. He didn't go to hell like most people. He most likely went to the bottomless pit. But they got to get uh, another disciple, another apostle to take his place. And in chapter 2, you've got Pentecost, the famous chapter that all the cults love to run to. And this is one of the most controversial chapters in all of the Bible. You have the apostles, 
and they are filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues. In Acts 2, 4 through 6, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now notice the apostles weren't just speaking some unknown alien language from Mars type of language. It says every man heard them speak in his own language. Also notice that they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews. You see, you remember how I told you that the tongues are for a sign to unbelieving Jews. And it says in verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now look at verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So once again, they're hearing the apostles speak in the tongue from the place which they were born in. It was an actual language being spoken. In Acts 2.22, You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Peter says, You men of Israel, hear these words. Peter is talking to Jews. He says, Ye men of Israel. This is key for understanding Acts 2. Him being delivered by the determinate for count, determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So Peter is pricking their heart about crucifying Jesus Christ. And seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. So Peter is letting them know that Jesus Christ was slain by wicked hands, buried and resurrected. And it says in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now this is one of the greatest Stumbling block verses for most cults. They teach that to be saved, you have to be baptized in Jesus' name only. And, and they just teach baptismal regeneration because of this verse. In Acts 2, the apostle Peter is preaching to Jews who have just crucified their Messiah. And for this reason, they are pricked at their heart and say, what shall we do? So they get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But this is, this is, it's not what you think. And look at it. It says, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Is this order to get, in order to get remission of sins? Or because they already got it? You see, the word for doesn't always mean in order to get. It can mean because you already have it. I think the best example I heard somebody give was uh, take a Tylenol for your headache. Are you taking a Tylenol to get a headache or because you've already got it? Do you get baptized to get remission of sins or because you've already got it? So, they get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and they receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this is completely different than how we get the Holy Ghost today. I got the Holy Ghost the moment I believed the gospel. And the book of Acts is a transition book. It is giving you the history of the early church. And you have some things going on during the transition that don't apply to today. Because it's a transition from Israel to the church. And in the first seven chapters what you have is God offering the kingdom to Israel once again. And if they accept it. If they accept Jesus Christ and the message being preached, then the church age isn't ever even going to happen. And that's what's going on in the first seven chapters. And so you can't just... I wouldn't take everything in the book of Acts doctrinally for me today. You need to look at Paul's epistles and filter everything through that. 
Because you're going to see in other places where people get the Holy Ghost completely differently than they do in Acts 2. And see, we don't get the Holy Ghost by being baptized. We don't get the Holy Ghost by somebody laying hands on us. We get the Holy Ghost the moment we believe the gospel. And in chapters 3 through 6, it gives history of the early church as it begins to grow. And in Acts 3, uh, Peter and John heal the beggar. And here you will see the Jews reject Jesus Christ after seeing miracles and hearing the preaching of Peter. It says in Acts 3, 12 through 15, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. You're going to see that they reject the message that Peter preached in Acts 4. Peter and John are taken before the council. And it says in Acts 4, 2 through 3, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. But look what happens. Peter continues to preach Jesus Christ anyway. In verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, unto all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before you whole. Notice two things about Peter here is that when he is filled with the Spirit, he isn't afraid of the rulers and elders of Israel. And he also gives God the glory. He doesn't try to take it for himself. So he is humble and doesn't want the glory and he doesn't fear man. We need to pray for these characteristics that Peter has here. He says in Acts 4.11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is that stone he's talking about. Notice it is Peter who says this because there are all kinds of peop people who want to make Peter the rock. But Jesus is the rock. In Matthew sixteen eighteen, it says that I say unto thee, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, the rock isn't Peter, but it's actually Jesus Christ. So in Acts 4.11, Peter says, This is the stone. Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. He's, he breaks things in pieces. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the Almighty, the first and the last. And Peter goes on to preach one way to salvation. He says in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when these saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You see, I'm unlearned and ignorant. But I want to stay in the Bible so much that people can tell that I've been with Jesus Christ. Peter did some good preaching by, by just giving God the glory and preaching one way to heaven. Peter did some good preaching, but the rulers of the Jews stayed in rejection of Jesus Christ nonetheless. And they said in verse 17 and 18, but, it, but that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth no, to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. And you see this right here, this is coming to a town near you. They don't want you talking about Jesus or the Bible now. They will get rid of you soon if they can. But it says in verse 19, But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. He can't help but say it. 
just like Jeremiah couldn't help but say it. It was burning in him. Then moving on to Acts chapter 5, you got Ananias and Sapphira. Now check out the miracles the apostles were performing in chapter 5 so that they could convince the unbelieving Jews using signs that they would confirm the word with signs following. In Acts 5.15 it says, Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. So just the shadow of Peter could heal the people. That's almost as cool as a dead guy falling on Elijah's dead body and the dead guy got healed. Both of those are two, two of the coolest miracles in the Bible. It says in verse 16, There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. The apostles really had the power of God to do all these acts. The Catholic priests are known for exercising unclean spirits out of people today. But all that is just a trick to deceive people into thinking the Catholic Church is of God. If they really are getting devils out of people, then the devils are just allowing it to happen to deceive people into thinking the Catholic Church is the true church. But they don't have the same gifts as the apostles. I believe some men have had the power to get devils out of people in the day we're living in, but it's nothing like what the apostles had. In Acts 5, 30 through 31, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Notice, he is preaching for Israel to repent. There is still a chance for them here in Acts chapter 5. And the apostles are arrested. In verse 38 and 39, it says, And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. How would you like to get in the ring with God himself? Conor McGregor said he could beat up Jesus, and look what happened to him. He broke his leg. It says in Acts 40, And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So they just got almost beat to death and rejoiced because they were counted worthy to suffer shame. They counted it an honor to suffer for Jesus Christ, and I want that attitude. I want to consider it a privilege. It says in Acts 5.42, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. And this is just a great verse. They got beat to death. And the people commanded them not to speak in the Lord's name. And then it says they ceased not to preach and to, and to teach Jesus Christ. They kept doing it anyway. But I'm going to close this one for now and pick back up in Acts chapter 6.